I think I'm confident in saying that this is the first time I've ever had to climb a ladder to preach a sermon. So I am happy to do that. I'm also trying to decide whether I want to use paper notes or switch to an iPad. We'll, we'll see how this goes. I may need to use my phone as a paperweight or something here, so bear with me as I struggle with my setup up here. While I struggle, if you brought your Bibles, please turn to Luke chapter 10. I'm going to be reading a few verses from Luke's gospel this morning and preaching out of that text. Luke chapter 10, we'll be beginning, beginning in verse 21 and on down to verse 24. At that time, Jesus was filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit. And he said, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike. Yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. My Father has entrusted everything to me. No one truly knows the Son except the Father, and no one truly knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then when they were alone, he turned to the disciples and said, Blessed are the eyes that see what you have seen. I tell you, many prophets and kings long to see what you see, but they didn't see it. And they long to hear what you hear, but they didn't hear it. Now, our text began this morning with the phrase, at that same time, which whenever we're reading the scriptures and we see a phrase like that, we know it's an indicator or a cue to look at what just came before it. So as we were looking at begin, uh, chapter 10, beginning of verse 21, if we were to hit the rewind button and go all the way back to the beginning of chapter 10, we'd see Luke says that, that at this time the Lord chose, in, in the NLT it says 72. Other translations will say 70, and I actually prefer 70 as the, the, the translation there, but we'll stick with the NLT for today. Chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead of him in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. You probably remember the story of when Jesus sent ahead a larger group of his disciples to proclaim to the, the villages and the cities that he was about to go to that the kingdom of God was at hand. And this was no small deal. You know, it's, it's real easy to follow Jesus in a sense, is it not? The crowds all followed him. Everywhere he went, there were, there were crowds that, that followed him and tracked his every move. At times, he had a hard time just getting away from people that were following him. But while there were many who followed him, this was the first time that a large group of his followers made that transition from follower to heralder, to heralding his arrival, his coming, in preparation of him physically coming to that area or that location. Get down to verse 17, and this group of 70 return, and they report to Jesus their great success. Lord, they say, even the demons obey us when we use your name. To which Jesus replies in the next few verses, 18 through 20, about, yeah, of course they did. It's because I gave you authority over them. It is because of me in my name, the authority of my name, that you have power over evil. Which brings us now to our text. Verse 21. Luke says, at that same time, just as they have all returned from their successful evangelistic effort, their missionary activity has concluded, they've returned to Jesus, and at that same time, Luke says, Jesus was filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Now that's a really curious and interesting expression, filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit. It does not mean that Jesus was just in a really good mood. This doesn't mean that, that Jesus just had a really yummy meal and his, his blood sugar levels are all correct now. And he's, he's really, like, at my house, it's amazing the difference between pre-meal attitudes and, be, and moods and post-meal. Before, you know, it's, it's kind of gritty and, you know, a little anxious and, for me, often frustrated. And then once I've had my meal and everything is right with the world, I can't get the smile off my face. 
You know what I'm talking about. We all have those kinds of issues at times. That's not what was happening here. Jesus wasn't just in a really good mood. Instead, this expression means that Jesus exalted. It means Jesus rejoiced exceedingly. This is a, almost an uncontrollable reaction that, that wells up from deep within Jesus at some, something that has happened. This expression, as you, if you were to look through the Gospels for this expression, you'll find that it is often linked when describing the great acts of God's salvation throughout history. So in John chapter 8, when Jesus is talking about Abraham, he says this, this, this rejoicing deep within, this expression of great joy and exaltation, this is what Abraham experienced when he looked ahead to the fulfillment of, of all of God's promises for his life. Abraham rejoiced, Jesus said. He rejoiced as he looked forward to my coming. He saw it by faith and was glad. We see this expression at the beginning of Luke's gospel in Luke chapter one, as the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and and announces to her that the incredible news of the incarnation, Mary's response, oh, how my soul, oh, how it rejoices. This deep swelling of exultant praise and joy just overflows up out of the heart from deep within at the great things that God is doing. And therefore, it's fitting that this is the, the, the song of the redeemed at the marriage supper, marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation 19. You see it from the beginning of God's work of salvation to the, the pinnacle of, 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 his, of his promises beginning to be fulfilled in Jesus and all the way to the very end in the consummation at the marriage supper of the Lamb. John says, I heard what sounded like a shout of a vast crowd or the roar of a mighty ocean or the crash of loud thunder. Praise the Lord. For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let's be glad and rejoice. This feeling, this emotion, this swelling of praise and exaltation, let us give honor to him. For the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb, and the bride has prepared herself. Now very seldom in the scriptures is this expression applied directly to Jesus as it is here in Luke chapter 10. In fact, I think it, it has only been applied to Jesus twice in all of the scriptures. It's, it's not a common expression for Jesus. Jesus, after all, is the man of sorrows, isn't he? He's the one who entered into our sinful state. He took upon himself all of our condition and suffered the consequences of that. He experienced the, the effects, not just the, the legal penalties, but he bore in his body the effects of our sinfulness. But here, Luke says... Here, Jesus had joy in the Holy Spirit. Why? Well, that's what we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at this morning. i got three reasons from the text here that I believe Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. The first is this. Jesus rejoices at the Father's good pleasure. Look again at verse 21. He, He prays this prayer to his Father. Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike. Yes, here's what I want you to focus on. Yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. Jesus exalts in the fulfillment of the Father's will. Now, we know from the Gospel of John that it is the Father's will that nourishes Jesus, that sustains Jesus, that keeps him going. He says in John chapter 4, verse 34, my nourishment, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God, the one who sent me. My nourishment comes from finishing his work. We know from later in John that it is the will of God that is what Jesus was preoccupied with every moment of his life. John chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus says, I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not my own will. But here in Luke's gospel, 
we see that not only is the will of God that which nourishes Jesus and sustains Jesus, and not only is doing the will of God that thing that preoccupies all of Jesus' attention and all of his energy and his activity. No, Luke tells us even more. It is the will of God that brings him great joy in the Holy Spirit. And friends, you and I today can, can take, a, take something from that for our lives. Because the beginning of true joy for your life and for mine, for all of us who are filled by his Holy Spirit, begins with knowing and doing the will of God. Even when the will of God is inconvenient. Even when, will of the, God, when the will of God is costly. Even when it is, it is difficult and, is, and requires great sacrifice. You can be sure that even in then, that joy, true joy, awaits those who live a life like Jesus, being about the Father's business, doing that which brings pleasure to the Father's heart. Jesus rejoiced at the Father's good pleasure. Secondly, Jesus rejoices at the Father's wise ways. Look again at verse 21. We're going to spend a lot of time in verse 21 today. There's a lot there in this prayer of Jesus. He says, thank you. Thank you for what? Thank you, Father, for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike. You see here, Jesus in the Spirit is rejoicing at how the Father works. God doesn't operate like you and I tend to operate, does he? Many times in, in our, our, our corporate worship, we've, we've discussed and we've reflected upon and we've even praised God for the fact that God's ways are not our ways, that he, he operates in a different time frame than we do and he operates in different manners than we ever would. And in this case, we see that God, in the execution of his, of his sovereign plan and will, God chooses the least likely people for his gracious works. Now imagine yourself for a minute that you here in this, in this scene are Jesus. And, and the, the people that you've just sent out on this, this missionary journey have returned. What do you think you would be seeing? Picture, picture it right now in your mind's eye. What, what would Jesus be seeing as this group of people came back? It wasn't a bunch of professionals. It wasn't a bunch of noble people. It wasn't a bunch of experts, scholars. This scene of, of people, re, of these missionaries returning to Jesus is nothing like what we see on, on TV when, when there's a, a presidential troop review, right? Where the military comes, comes in front of the president with, with great power and great precision. This is all, all provoking scene. That's not what Jesus saw, not by a long shot. No, Jesus, Jesus saw this very ragtag group of very ordinary people. People without rank, people without position, people without great influence. And as Jesus sees this, this procession of ordinary people coming back from an extraordinary job, well, he gives praise to God. He thanks God that, that God has chosen people to be recipients and instruments of his work. And in, in the people that he has chosen, he has looked away from, from all the typical power brokers of human influence. Those instead who think that they are wise, those who think that they are clever, they will never know or experience the things of God. For those things belong exclusively to the simple. Those things belong exclusively to those who come to God and receive the things of God with faith like a child. Now, we were just here <laughs> just a, a couple of months ago. You may recall back at the beginning of March before all this pandemic craziness broke. We were in the middle of Lent and we were marching through this series on, on, uh, on the cross and, and we were on that that passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 where Paul talks about the foolishness of the cross. And he quotes from Isaiah 29 and he says, 
This is what the scriptures say. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does that leave the philosophers? Where does that leave the scholars, the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of the world in Christ look foolish. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish, that's you and me, in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. And as a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. God has chosen to reveal himself to and to use for his purposes the weak, the powerless, the humble, in order to shame the proud, the mighty, and the strong. Jesus exalts in the Holy Spirit that the Father has hidden and revealed, as he says, these things. Well, what are the things? (laughs) Okay, Jesus, what are the things that the Father has hidden? What are those things that the Father has revealed? Well, they're essentially those truths about Jesus' identity and Jesus' mission. The Father reveals and the Father conceals the truth of who Jesus is and what he came to do. That Jesus is the one who alone truly knows the Father, the one who is truly known by the Father, as he says in verse 22. The one to whom the Father has entrusted all things. The one who alone can make the Father known personally in a saving way. You know, Christianity has never been about knowing all about the Bible. There are many of you here today, myself included, who walk with Jesus intimately day by day, but there's so much about the Bible you still don't yet understand or know. There's, there's whole books of the Bible that you probably haven't read in years. Knowing about the Bible, even being able to memorize and quote the Bible, is not what, the, what Christianity is primarily all about. It's not about knowing all the different theologies or all the different apologetic arguments. It's not about being able to to stand in a debate and perfectly articulate all the tenets of the faith. Now, those things are important. But that's not at the very heart and the very essence of what Christianity is. Christianity has never been about just knowing about God. Christianity has been about knowing God. Through Christ not according to earthly wisdom, but according and by, and, and by heavenly grace. God has revealed himself personally through the Son so that you and I can know him in a saving way. And Jesus says, if you want to know God in a saving way, there's only one way to do it. You look at me. You look at me. The scriptures, they pointed to me. They make zero sense apart from me. And you can have memorized all of your Old Testament, but if and and the Pharisees did. They knew the Old Testament from beginning to end. They knew all the laws, all the rules, all the guidelines, and everything that was added to them. And yet, they didn't know God in a saving way through Christ. Jesus says, if you want to know the Father, you have to look to me. I am the word of the Father in the flesh. I am the only eternally begotten one who came from the Father's own heart. And I have come, as John says in his prologue, to explain him to you. In Jesus, in our text here, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus rejoices in the Holy Spirit that the Father is being revealed to the world through his life. Isn't that beautiful? That Jesus' joy comes from knowing that by his life, people come to know God. And friends, in the same way, you and I can have joy in the Holy Spirit whenever the world 
whenever the world around us, the world that we find ourselves in, whenever that world comes to know God through our lives, there is joy in the Holy Spirit for you. When people look at you and see in you, and not just you as an individual, us as a corporate, the, the corporate life of God in the world, the body of Christ, the living embodiment of his, of his life in flesh in the world today, filled by and empowered by his spirit. When the world looks at this church and other churches, we as as the church, when the world looks at us and by our life together, sees and knows the Father in a saving way, oh, there's great rejoicing that comes from that. Since God in his wisdom, the apostle continues, saw fit that the world would never know him through human wisdom. He has used our foolish preaching, our foolish preaching, to save those who believe. You and I can rejoice today at the unfathomable depths of the wisdom of God's ways. And thirdly, Jesus rejoices at the glimpse of, Remember what he's seeing here. Jesus rejoices at the glimpse he sees of the church's future. That's us, by the way. Our future. Our present. This first successful missionary journey by his disciples is basically a preview of the mighty works that Jesus' future followers would one day do in the power of the name of Jesus. If you look at your Bibles again, look back up a couple verses to verse 19. Look what Jesus says to his, his followers here. They, they, they came back in verse 17, we even have power to drive out demons in your name. And Jesus says, that's because I, I have given you authority. You know, Christ's ambassadors, those who represent him and go forward in his name, you know, you and I don't limp out into the world in fear and impotence, do we? No, you and I can go out into the world as his messengers in boldness and in power to proclaim the kingdom of God. It is true. At the beginning of chapter 10, Jesus does say, look, I'm not going to sugarcoat this for you guys. It's dangerous out there. The world is hostile. The world is rejecting me. The world will reject you. I am sending you out like sheep amidst wolves. And I know many of you here today have a a home life, a work life, maybe your neighborhood, there's some sort of situation in your life where you feel like nothing more than a helpless sheep surrounded by hungry, ravenous wolves when it comes to your faith. You know exactly what Jesus is talking about here. And yet, (laughs) and yet, though he sends us out like sheep amidst the wolves, we can be confident that by his name, By his authority, by his power, by virtue of who he is, you and I can be messengers who proclaim the message victoriously. The success that the the 70 experience as they return, the success that they experienced was not due to their own efforts. It was not due to their own cleverness. It wasn't due to some particular method. Hey, if we just do this exact right method, we see it working there. As long as we do the same thing here and replicate that exactly, we'll have success. It's not a business model. It wasn't due to any of those things that they had any success whatsoever. What was it due to? It was due to the authority of the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus, friends, is powerful and mighty. And Jesus says, by my name, you will have power, all power, over the enemy. And that power is not limited to some select few individuals that are called to do some very specific task. No, that power is for all who are sent by him. This is amazing to me. This this is happening while Jesus is still walking amongst people before the crucifixion, before the resurrection, before the, the, the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. This event is, is this incredible preview or snapshot or picture. It, it reaches 
forward in time and captures the very essence of the new age of the spirit that was inaugurated at Pentecost where the supernatural indwelling power of Jesus has come to his followers in the person of the Holy Spirit and he has come to dwell not just among a few but among all his people. And that was the hope, wasn't it? That was the forward hope and longing of all of the Old Testament for a time when God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. A time when the Holy Spirit would no longer confine his work to specific individuals who were doing a specific task. No, he would come upon and he would remain in and he would empower for his purposes all who would receive Christ by faith. Men and women, boys and girls, people who are ordinary but have some, someone in them who is extraordinary. And by his Spirit, we would have his heart his passion, his mind, his desire to seek and save that, that which is lost. And none of you, myself included, none of us who bear the name of Jesus can excuse ourselves from his service by pleading like Moses tried to do in the beginning of Exodus, his own inadequacy. None of us can get away with that. Because to that, God always declares, as he did to Moses, who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak? Hear or do not hear? See or do not see? Who decides those things? Is it not I, the Lord? If that is true, then go. Go, Moses. It doesn't matter if you can speak. It doesn't matter if you can hear. It doesn't matter if you can see, because I am with you, and I go with you, and I go in you, and it is by my power, my authority, my presence that you will do what I have called you to do. I will equip you with me, and I will instruct you in what to say. And so the question today, on this side of Pentecost, as we hear this these promises of God in the Old Testament, we see them fulfilled here in a, in a sort of a preview sort of way. But then later in Acts chapter 2, in all of its fullness, as we consider all of that, the question then becomes today, not whether or not you and I have been called to go and be a messenger, a heralder of the things of God, but whether you and I will hear and obey that call. The call is not to a few. The call is to all. The 70, well, they represented the all. It wasn't just the 12. It wasn't just the the representatives of the tribes, so to speak. It was the number that represents the totality of the people of God. The Great Commission is for the whole church, the entire body of Christ, to go and to be witnesses, to go and to and to proclaim to the nations what God in Christ has done to make disciples of all the nations. And by his spirit, Jesus has given us everything we need. You know, my, probably my favorite part about chapter 10, when Jesus sends the 70 out, my favorite part about it, I think, is that he basically sends them with nothing. <laughs> Don't take a dime Don't take a change of shoes. Have you ever gone on a trip without a change of shoes? If you have, boy, you're living on the edge. Because if you have a blowout, like I had a few years ago on Easter Sunday, maybe you were, there were some of you in the hallway when you saw it. I was walking down the hallway. You know, I'm I'm always harried around a big kind of holiday, and I'm always scurrying around, and I I just need to take a chill pill sometimes. Um, But I was going down the hallway right here in the building, and I had a massive blowout in my right dress shoe. I mean, the whole... I guess it would be the sole, the sole of my shoe. I lost the sole of my shoe. <laughs> it went to where there is outer darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth. It was lost right there in the hallway. And I was now about an inch shorter on the right side. I was cockeyed Sean. I was walking around like this. It was awful. You can't go anywhere without a change of shoes. And Jesus did just that. You don't even take an extra pair of sandals. You need nothing, nothing but each other. Send them out in pairs, but you need nothing but me, my name, my word, my presence by my spirit. And armed with the word of God, 
and empowered by the Spirit of God, you and I can and we must go out and declare the good news. And in our sentness, you and I can be more than conquerors. Seeing his church in mission, like Jesus saw that day, at that same time, according to the Father's will and ways, well, that prompted Jesus to rejoice in the Holy Spirit. God has deigned to incorporate you and me into his mighty acts of salvation through our Spirit-empowered witness and proclamation of his saving mercies. Workers sent out into fields white unto harvest. Fishers of men. It's why the Father gave us his Son and his Spirit. And it is for that purpose that you and I, that this church exists. The joy of the Holy Spirit is in being sent to do the Father's will according to the Father's ways, to the glory of the Father, Son, and Spirit. You know, today is a pretty happy day, isn't it? (laughs) When I started seeing cars pulling up and people getting out, I had a smile that was so big on my face it started to hurt my cheeks a little bit. And I know, Mary, you've got one of those smiles right now. Your face looks like it's very painful right now. There's such a big smile. I love it. This is a happy day, a joyful day. It's hard to believe that on a day this perfect, even with the, even the breeze is perfect. Everything is perfect right here. It's hard to believe that on a day this glorious and this joyful and this happy that there's so much misery and chaos and disorder in the world right now. I made the mistake of looking at the headlines this morning. <laughs> and my, my steady, rising optimism and joy just kind of like, didn't just plateau for a few moments, it kind of crashed as I, as I just considered once again, what is going on in the world? Pandemics and riots and craziness and misery, it's everywhere we look. And I'm shocked and I'm sickened by it all. And yet, here we are and we're back together and we're smiling and we're happy. We're enjoying this momentary reprieve from quarantine, even though a lot of you are, still feel kind of confined to your cars. We're still around other people, human beings. There are other, other human beings still in the world. It's hard to believe, but it's still true. You're still here. I'm still here. We're in, rejoicing in the, the beauty of God's creation, grateful that we finally have a Pentecost Sunday where it's not raining. Thank you, Lord, for the absence of rain. But let's not forget the purpose of why we exist. It's not to come and have a nice church service, is it? I'm so grateful for all the work that went into this. It just boggles the mind how many wires need to be connected and things fine-tuned and pieces, equipment moved around. But at the end of the day, having a nice church service is not why we exist it's, it's not why we have Pentecost outside, to have a nice outdoor service. We have a Pentecost service outside because it is a very tangible reminder and expression that the Holy Spirit compels us to go out of this wonderful building that we have, to be the people of God, not just when we're together in a, in a confined space, but to be the people of God in a lost and dying world. Everywhere we go, We bring the kingdom with us because the kingdom has been established in your hearts by the presence of Christ, by his spirit. And you and I need to go out into the world in a a very intentional way, a way that acknowledges that it is desperate for life and for hope and for purpose and for healing and for peace and for joy the very joy that you and I have in our hearts because of all these things we've been talking about this morning, the joy, the world does not have it. But you can bring it to the world when you embody and proclaim the gospel with all of your life. The Holy Spirit, friends, is at work. He's here right now in our midst, whether you are 
in this parking lot or whether you're watching online, we're all here together. The Holy Spirit is present. He is at work this Pentecost Sunday, opening the eyes of faith for the humble, revealing the identity and purposes of Christ, illuminating minds and hearts to the things of God. The Holy Spirit is at work right now, aligning your will and my will to the will of the Father. And when he's doing that, he's producing in us a joy that comes from knowing and doing the things that bring pleasure to God. The Holy Spirit is still at work in sending his people, ordinary people, people like you and people like me, to a lost and dying world to be harbingers of his great salvation. Blessed are the eyes, Jesus says, that see what you have seen. Many prophets and kings long to see what you see, but they didn't see it. And they long to hear what you hear, and they didn't hear it. For that, I say, rejoice. Rejoice in the Holy Spirit today, because you and I know the Holy One by name. He has filled us with his life and his purposes, and his power. And most of all, as Jesus says, rejoice because your name and my name is registered in heaven today. Rejoice, people of God, in the Holy Spirit of God. Again, I say rejoice. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for this beautiful day that you have given us. It is such a gift. Every day is a gift, but this day in particular, our hearts are are overcome by joy, joy of being counted among the names in heaven, joy of being numbered among your saints here on earth, joy at being together once again to experience the the incredible, wonderful life of your people here on earth, this snapshot, this glimpse, this foretaste of eternity the people of God, filled with the the presence and the persons of God, all to the glory of God. Thank you for this day. Thank you, Father, that, that you are still at work in the world and that your will and your ways are so much greater than our own. Lord, align us to your will. Send us out according to your ways. Do your work in us. Reveal yourself through our shared life together. And when you do that, Lord, would you draw people to Christ? Lift up Christ in me. Holy Spirit, point people through my life, through our life, to Jesus. That people may come to know God in a saving, personal way. Lord, may we be a sent people who are not content with just sitting behind a screen or showing up to a nice service hiding behind our excuses that we're not smart enough or eloquent enough or trained enough or bold enough or outspoken, whatever the excuses, Lord, may all those things crumble and collapse in the presence of your mightiness. Lord, may your power become our power. Thank you that you, you demonstrate your power and in our weakness and that you want to use us to shame the strong. Lord, may we be a people who embody the truths of your word today and go out on this Pentecost Sunday and be your people throughout the world. Lord, may your great commission be fulfilled in me and in us, we pray today in Jesus' name. Amen.